I'm Dobra Malters, and welcome to Irrelevant People, a saga of uninteresting privilege. We begin today with Billy Pilgrim. Billy is an optometrist, war veteran, and horrible father. Now, usually we dissect the lives of horrendously dull and average citizens so that viewers like you can feel better about your lives. Today's episode is no different, except for the fact that Billy Pilgrim was... unstuck in time. <gasps> However, Mr. Pilgrim had a conventional childhood with conventional traumas that affected him later in life. I am Schmarber Schmalters, a woman with a thirst for the truth and heels to go run and get it. Now, I have tracked down a lowly park ranger who saw the young Mr. Pilgrim as a boy on a family vacation to the Grand Canyon. Yeah, so they just stood on the edge of the canyon and the boy pissed himself. I'm sorry, he did what? Pissed himself in the pants, just by looking at the canyon. Billy Pilgrim. Pissed hams pants. I don't know how else to say it, lady. What even is this? A documentary? I need to get out of here. They're filming another Joe Dirt movie in here in an hour. Oh, I love those films. But wait! There's more! Billy Pilgrim was seen being pathetic in a place where it is against the rules to piss your pants. The public pool. I had a chance to sit down with the second favorite granddaughter of the lifeguard that was on duty that day. Can you describe to me the embarrassing scene that day? Well, Grand Mary was up in her chair looking cute and minding her own business when this dad tries to teach his kid to swim, right? Well, dad tosses his boy to the deep end and the little turd doesn't even try to swim. He sinks like a rock all the way to the bottom. Wow, what did the dad do? Nothing. Nothing like the threat of death will teach your kid to swim. Well, what happened to the kid? Oh, Grandmammy let him hang out down there for a minute, then she had to get up and rescue him. You won't believe how embarrassed the dad was. Imagine having a kid who just doesn't go off the deep end. So you see, Billy Pilgrim was embarrassing from the very beginning of his life. A sad excuse of a human being. Pitiful. Pathetic. Disgusting. This trend continued as he grew up and married... Uh, oh. Valencia. I traveled to Ilium, New York to pick the mediocre brains of Mr. Pilgrim's children about his adult life. What they had to say was... Shocking. It's nice to finally meet you, Robert and Barbara. Likewise. I love your pantsuit and oh, we even share the same name. No, darling. My name is Winabra Balters. This is my newscast. Stop trying to pull focus, piano legs. Anywho, I wanted to ask you two about your parents. How did they meet? Well, my father and I weren't that close. He liked me, but he didn't know me very well. They were always a little bit unusual, but I mean, they had an unusual start. They married as soon as my dad was discharged from the mental institution. I mean, he would have to be mentally ill to marry that. That's our mom you're talking about! Oh, and what about it? Clearly the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree. Anyway, uh, I still think their marriage was merely an arrangement. I mean, how else will Dad have sailed through optometry school? Oh? How can you say that, Robert? They loved each other. They were Queen Elizabeth and Christopher Columbus. You know that, Robert. Oh dear, the emotions are certainly pouring out. My dear, could you tell me, why do you consume so much candy? I'm sorry, really. Well, ever since our mom died, Barbara hasn't stopped eating candy. Just like mom would do. Oh, Valencia's death. Was it really a loss, though? I'm sorry? What? Going back to you, uh, about your father, Billy Pilgrim. You said he was in a mental institution. For PTSD, yeah. He was pretty torn up about the war. And he was convinced that he had been abducted by aliens. He hijacked a radio station just to spread hysteria. It was so humiliating. I said to him, you know, there is no such planet as Tromalador. And his response was, it can't be detected from Earth. 
He was just making up as he went along. I said, what are we going to do with you, Father? What are we going to do with you? And what did you do with him? Well, there wasn't much we could do. He claimed to already know how he was going to die. You know, he couldn't be deterred. Welcome back. I'm Barbara Walters, and after an Ocean's Eleven style heist and subsequent high adrenaline police chase, I have obtained a tape from Billy Pilgrim's will stored in the First National Bank of Ilium, New York, and I wish to play it for you now. I, Billy Pilgrim, died, have died, and always will die on February 13th, 1976. I am chilled to confirm that Billy Pilgrim did, in fact, die on February 13th, 1976. But how could a man, a boring one at that, accurately predict his own death? For the answer, I have interviewed a close acquaintance of Mr. Pilgrim. Ladies and gentlemen, my fellow Americans, we now, for the first time ever, speak to a Trothamadorian. And here we are with our special guest. So tell me, sir, why did you choose to abduct Billy Pilgrim of all people? what that creature just said. However, it begs the question, what affected Mr. Pilgrim more? The war or the alien abduction? In order to shine light on this most precarious and dark question, I sat down with one of the few survivors of the firebombing of Dresden. All right, everyone, very exciting. We are on the scene about to get some live information. All right, follow me, let's go. Ma'am, ma'am, do you have anything to say about the firebombing of Dresden? But I have no idea what she said either. However, while I was there, I found a pile of horse bones. <laughs> One local I actually spoke to remembered that when Billy saw the condition of his mode of transportation, the horses, he burst into tears. He hadn't cried about anything else in the war. Not only was Billy Pilgrim pathetic, he was near emotionless, heartless even. The local who gave me this key piece of evidence was an innkeeper on the outskirts of Dresden. I interviewed him many moons ago. He is dead now. So it goes. He did have a very vivid description of Billy, though. So, this next scene took so long to film, I think we had half an hour of raw footage for a minute and a half scene. I think there's like nine lines of dialogue. Um, they kept breaking character because our actors are, uh, they, well, we were having fun filming, you know, it was great. Um, we were going to film again, then the camera died. So what you're about to see is what you're going to get. It is literally terrible. And I, not that everything before this part was um, Oscar award winning or anything because it wasn't and I'm but I was just trying to edit it and I thought I could save it but I can't um, but as you all know in Slaughterhouse 5 um, Billy they have the whole religious illusion they stay in the the barn and the inn outside of Dresden and Darbra is supposed to be interviewing the innkeeper right now I don't know if he would have ever caught that though based on what happens and so talking about it more, I'm going to show you, because it's really bad. All right. This is take 97 of the innkeeper scene. Guten Tag, Dabra. It's Sarah, and hello. I'm very excited to speak with you this evening. My question to you is, in fact, not a statement, but rather a spoken sentence meant to retrieve information from you. So I may write it down. Do you understand? Was that the question? No, keep up. Why is she not looking at him? The question is this. What did Dresden look like after it was bombed? Well, I remember the tall skinny American man saying it looked like the moon. <laughs> oh, we, we don't 
don't know what the moon looks like. It's widely accepted that the moon landing never happened. How do you know you are credible? Them. Don't interrupt me, please. Well, since you can't tell me factually what Dresden looked like after the bombing, clue me in to how it was during the bombing. What? I remember it like it was, yes. We were so close! This is where we started to lose our minds. Oh, I'll be fine. I'll be fine. Just go. We gotta do it. I'm serious. Okay. I remember it like it was yesterday. I could see only the city afar off. It was lit up like an Easter fire. I heard from another Dresdenian that it was from a Z <laughs> lockdown. <laughs> Look at me in the eyes, you coward! <laughs> we we we're about to run out of battery, so we're not. Anessa! Yeah, we're gonna need it, because we still got scenes to But then we got back on track. Oh, I remembered like it was yesterday. I could only see the city afar off, but it was lit up like an Easter fire. I heard from another Dresdenian that it was from the Schlachthaus food! <laughs> Gesundheit! The story goes like this. What is that noise? Mm -hmm. You got a crab? Yeah, here you go. Mm. It was horrible! They got dust in their hair! In their hair! <laughs> I know. The idea was to hasten the end of the war, but really all the Americans wanted to prove was that they had the biggest bombs. I, I'm sorry, but where does Billy fit into all of this? He was the one who survived! He came running into my inn and begged for a place to stay, and then he was there when they began corpse hunting. Chilling. And he was properly trained to do so. What? No, no, silly lady. He was an assistant to the Chaplain, after all. He knew nothing. You mean to tell me Billy Pilgrim was a pathetic excuse for a human being during the war as well? That he had no reason to be there? I would say so, yeah. <sighs> You're saying the most useless, unpatriotic, and meek, sorry excuse of a soldier survived? But people who actually matter die? Yes, that is exactly what I am saying. God, I love being a journalist! Barbara, you are a strong and independent woman. Oh, thank you, Comet. Oh, uh, hello, I'm Rwambra Salters. Earlier, I sat down with Billy's only friend, the elusive sci-fi author Kilgore Trout. Mr. Trout, my first question for you is, are you aware no component of your name is actually a name? Absolutely. Right, moving on. It is my understanding that you were a close friend of Billy Pilgrim's. I mean, he was a big fan of my novels and he helped me deliver newspapers once. You are a talentless imbecile. Switching gears though, could you tell me about Mr. Pilgrim's death? Thank you, it. Yes, certainly. At the end of his mundane, privileged life, Billy Pilgrim began touring, giving speeches. He was an illustrious, charismatic speaker. Well, as long as you were several yards away. He was in Chicago, which is in a separate country now far away from here, I'm sure you know, when he was assassinated. You see, he made an enemy during the war, Paul Lazaro. Lazaro promised to have Billy murdered, whether he did it himself or he hired someone. And Lazaro did just that one night after Billy's speech in the Chicago Sovereign State. Well, Billy was given a gift by Trophimadorians. He became unstuck in time. He knew when he was going to die and how he was going to die. Yet he did nothing to stop it. You know, he even said, if you think that death is a terrible thing, then you have not understood a word I've said. That was on his final night of life, too. What he exhibited was extreme self-control and awareness of the little amount of free will that we all possess. He was a visionary. Every aspect of him. His physique, his lack of talents, his opinions, they all defied the common notion of what a soldier is, of what a war veteran is. And yet he didn't care. He found comfort in knowing that we cannot control anything. He was given every pleasure he could ever ask for in life, and he was not humble, nor was he ostentatious. He was Billy. Just Billy Pilgrim. The man who became unstuck in time. Who let him in here? Welcome back. For the last time, I am Jeremy Edwards, and before we all experience such sweet sorrow by parting, 
I'd like to thank each of our interviewees and highlight what they thought of the subject of this broadcast. Billy Pilgrim. What I think of him? Well, I guess he should probably have better control of his bladder. He should just kept swimming. Grandmammy's name was Dory, by the way. Well, he was a troubled man. He lived a very nice life, though. I'm out of Starburst. He should have taken better care of those horses. What? Billy? Who's Billy? And with that, my dear viewers, our program has come to an end. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Irrelevant People, a saga of uninteresting privilege. I'm Darbra Malters, and have a great night. Seriously, what is it with the security in this place?